Okay, well, Sam, welcome to the Freedom Pack podcast. Thank you. It's great to be here. So before we dive in, um, for any of the audience who aren't familiar with yourself and your work, do you want to just give them a little bit of context to your background, who you are and what you do? Yeah, well, my name is Samuel Whiting. I'm from Massachusetts in the USA, and I grew up in nature as a, as a kid playing in the woods, loving to ride my bike. I got into ski racing at a young age and really was committed and, and had a deep discipline in, in that sport. And so really I grew up in the cold, uh, bombing the mountain, having fun out with friends. And from there, I really followed an intuitive path of going to university. I was exploring music as a kid and, and a lot of that was very creative. I loved building things. Um, and that led me to being entrepreneurial. I started a music label at one time. I got really into DJing and that was kind of coupled with going to university and studying business to start my own record label and, and start traveling and doing gigs. And just around the launch of the record label that I started, I experienced the first loss of my life, which was when my, my mom's dad, my grandfather passed away. And I was at the time I was experiencing somewhat of a relief. Um, maybe some people resonate if you're a competitive athlete, the pressure, the intensity of training, the discipline, it felt great to retire from ski racing. And so I went on this creative path of enjoying music and just not having that intensity in my life anymore. And when this loss came out of nowhere, processing the grief, and just being so shocked to have somebody that you love in your life leave so abruptly and that when I came together with my family to for his service, uh, all of my cousins were there, all of our family was doing the preparations for the service and they said, why don't you all just get out and go do something together? And my cousin suggested that we go to a yoga class. And that was really a turning point for me where I went into this hot power yoga class, not expecting or knowing what I was getting myself into. And everything all came together from struggling to learn as a kid, the discipline and the intensity of, of training as an athlete, to then the creative and playful side of me, being on this mat, sweating, moving from pose to pose. Really the thing that captivated me there was the breath the sound of resonant ujjayi yogic type of breathing, being in a, in a room with others and moving, the sense of connection, where I could get out of my head. Like when I was younger, I would get caught in thinking all the time. I was like comparing because I couldn't read the fantasy books that other kids were in, in fourth grade, for example. And, and I started coming up with all these lies about myself, that, that I was stupid or that I wasn't good enough. So I ultimately created this mental battle with myself as my own worst enemy, which showed up as I went through athletics and, and different endeavors in life. But in that room, in that hot yoga room that day, the movement, the intensity, being in a group, the way that I started connecting to the, the rhythmical breathing, at the end of the class, I just felt myself so settled, calm, yet tired and serene and peaceful all at the same time. And it was one of the first moments that I really felt myself go outside of my thoughts and that I could just be. So that was a big catalyst in, in my whole journey through life up to this point. And really the breath was what kicked things off for me. So you talked a lot about there about breath. So for our listeners right now, maybe... Uh, tuning in they're thinking well breathing you know this is something my body does naturally for me something I've never had to think about before why should they care why does breathing matter so much it's a great question why does breathing matter um, well it's the first thing that we do as we enter this world and it's the last thing that we do as we leave our bodies and birth and death and I always love, I meditate on this every day. We take about 600 million to a billion breaths in our life. And so I always visualize that being like a breath bank. You know, we, um, we can save money in the bank. We can be 
effective with our time management, but do we really appreciate each breath? And to consider that each breath we take is one less breath that we'll have in our life. So that's just a humbling perspective that I love to, to start my days with, to remind myself that as I move through my day, you know, as, as human beings with our nervous systems and this, the power of our minds and brains, how it's evolved over, um, over millions of years that we can be able to take ourselves into the future and we can also uh, tether ourselves into the past. And especially now you hear about mindfulness and meditation, all these different practices, how we can get more present. How can we be in the moment? And what's so beautiful about breathing is that we can't breathe tomorrow. We can't breathe yesterday. It's something that's literally happening right now. And breath is what fuels life. It's what fuels metabolic energy in our cells. So it really is the secret ingredient, the magic molecules that make energy and give us vitality and, and ignite our spirits to be alive right here and now. And so it's literally connected to everything that we do from movement, from speech, going to the bathroom, connecting with others. It's, it's really a language that goes beyond words. And I think breath is something that maybe we take for granted sometimes. And so my, my path and my commitment and my exploration has really taken me to looking at something that's so fundamental in our human experience, in our, in our nature and how through building awareness and understanding and, and skill to use our breath that we can then start to steer ourselves more consciously, more tactically, and be able to really inspire this extraordinary that lives within all of us. Beautifully put. So I want to just sort of pull on the, the, that thread a little. So it sounds to me like just hearing you speak, it, it almost sounds poetic. It sounds like there's almost a spiritual element to breathe in. Now, when I try and break down topics like this that interest me so much, I try and think of them from the perspective of someone like my dad. So he's a very logical thinker. I wouldn't say he's very spiritual at all. He's probably, he, maybe he'll be listening to this right now thinking, well, maybe this isn't for me. Maybe, you know, I'm not a spiritual person. This sounds a bit, you know, outside of my field. Is this going to be relevant to me? Is there going to be any benefit to me um, from, a, from a physical, from a practical point of view? What would you say to someone who's questioning that? Well, I love this question and overall, because one of my missions is really to make these practices accessible to everybody in the world. And coming from an athletic background, exploring yogic perspectives, and then seeing how breathing really can fit within that full spectrum. You know, we can have deep breathing practices that bring us into what feels like a spiritual experience or even a psychedelic experience seeing colors or just how, how deeper breathing practices can evoke certain states within us. But at the same time, breathing is from a nervous system perspective or a neurobiological perspective, it's a behavior. So I always like to meet people where they are and, and it's great to be skeptical in a sense because then we can continue to ask questions. That's really what the science is pointing towards. It's when we have disagreements that uh, different perspectives can come in and ultimately that we can build a foundation of understanding. So it's not about being right or wrong or good breathing or bad breathing. Maybe there's components within that as a nuance, but ultimately breathing as a behavior, it shows up in everything we do as we, we started off our conversation. Think about what happens when you get surprised. <gasps> breathing shows up in its own unique way or when you get home from a long day whether it's been a hike in nature or a lot of tasks at work and you get home and you lie down on the couch <sighs> so when we start to bring our attention and our awareness to breath and notice how it shows up in our lives we can then look at this perspective that breathing is connected to our nervous system it's a fundamental component and certain ways of breathing affect our way of being and certain ways of being can affect our state of breathing. So these two things are very much interconnected and how we can start to bring attention to our breathing to 
bring out a certain state of being. So we can breathe in ways that build more energy. So we can be alert, we can be focused, whether it's physical activity or if we're at our desk and we have tasks to do, or we can breathe in certain ways that allow us to evoke a state of calm or to downregulate or let go of stress or tensions, emotions in our body. So in a simple way that there's so many unique ways to play with breath and make it uniquely yours. And that's really what practice is all about is the felt experiences that come up as you explore different patterns of breathing or protocols of breathing. It doesn't have to be um, a Sanskrit word. It doesn't have to be uh, any fancy protocol, but just simply bringing attention to observing your breath, watching how it's moving and feeling into how that's impacting your state of being, whether that's emotional, cognitive. And, and from there, often what happens is you end up having these deeper realizations within yourself or these insights. I like to think that a breathing practice is almost like taking the breath is like a magnifier and it's going to show, show you what you need to recognize within yourself. Yeah, it's really interesting you talk about that because I've always, I've understood the connection between, you know, the, the breath and the physical effects. I mean, I read, well, I actually interviewed James Nesto, who is great in this subject. Absolutely. Um, but over the last couple of months, I've been back and forth my GP with anxiety. Um, so we're trying to get to the root of these symptoms. Um, I experienced uh, two panic attacks. So I was really just trying to come to grips with all these different symptoms I was feeling. And the main one, well, after talking to my GP, we, we sort of focused in on the main symptom for me is my breath. And, you know, I, I get, I almost had this 24 hour a day thing where I felt like I couldn't take a satisfying breath without yawning first i needed to yawn to catch that satisfying breath and that kept happening and every time i would experience anxiety it would be my without even realizing that my breath would just pick up and i'd be shallow short breaths and i hadn't really realized the relationship between breath and something like mental health which is something i'd never really thought about but those last two months have just showed me what effect it can have on you, not just physically, but mentally as well, that relationship. Mm, absolutely. I like to think of breath as something that's psychophysiological. So it's psychology and physiology coming together. And as our nervous systems are very much information processing machines, the experiences that we've all had through life, whether it's an accident, a traumatic experience, just how, how we evolve and grow through our upbringing. And every day we're always changing. We're in a constant state of change and adaptation, our nervous system responding to all the, the different things that come through from light, from social environments, tasks, responsibilities. And so psychophysiology is the embedded meaning of the experiences that we've had that find their way into our body. And whether that be the fascia, we get an injury, the fascia heals and, and holds memory in it. And that shows up in our posture and through our posture that shows up into our brain and how we are perceiving life happening to us, the sensations that we feel, the thoughts that come through, the feelings or emotions that we have that literally then make up the actions that we take with. And that could be looking at mindset there of like, oh, well, I'm not, for, for my example, growing up, I, I had this embedded meaning that I was stupid because I didn't, I wasn't as good as, at math or I couldn't read as well as other people. So that immediately had a filter over the way that I would engage and take action for certain things. And, and that becomes this rut. There's this, this, um, scientific term as as they'll call long-term potentiation and as we neurons that fire together wire together so through repeated actions repeated thoughts repeated patterns we start to find ourselves in this this rut if you will if we were to walk around in a circle repeatedly it just keeps getting deeper and deeper and it's it becomes a challenge to get out of that and as breathing being a behavior or action that we take from moment to moment, as we start to shift those patterns, we can start to pop ourselves out of that rut, long-term depression, we're breaking down certain patterns. So this is a, a place that we can look to when 
exploring this phenomena of psychophysiology of how our psychological construct is finding its way into our physiology, finding its way into our breath behavior, that as we can then shift breath patterns, we can actually change the way that our mind is operating. So one thing I never heard, well, this is why I love subjects like this, because I know very little about it myself, which is why I find it so fascinating. But one subject I had really no awareness of was nasal breathing um, until I came across James Nestor. Uh, and since then, I try and do little things like, you know, is 30, as 30 nasal breaths a day, just, just a general rule, just conscious breaths. Just little things that got embedded into my routine. But what do you understand about the importance of nasal breathing and how, what's your relationship with it like on a day to day basis? Yeah, it's a great question and a, and a fascinating topic. I think there's, there's much to continue uncovering. Um, head nod to James for his work and contribution to the field in general. Um, definitely contributed to this breath wave that continues to build and getting this information out to the world. And what I find fascinating about nasal breathing, it's just the physiological components. Evolutionarily, this is what was designed for us to, to respire, to, to breathe. And within that, there's mechanisms that ultimately help us receive oxygen or receive the breath in, a, in the most optimal way, we could say. So there's little cilia in the nose, there's, fil there's hair, there's this, it's a filter. So as we inhale, the air passes through the turbinates, which are like three pathways on, on through both nasal passages. And I like to think of that as like the turbo booster. It's what's conditioning the air, whether it's dry air or very moist air, it's bringing it to the optimal conditioning so that then the, the oxygen, the air that goes into your lungs can be optimally received to the then um, go into the bloodstream itself. So that's one bonus around why nasal breathing. Um, keep getting that perfectly conditioned air so that you can receive oxygen in the most optimal way, additionally to filtering it. Um, so if everybody who's tuning in were just right now to take a breath through their nose, notice how does that feel? As opposed to just dropping your jaw and breathing in through your mouth, I mean, there's just subtleties that you can pick up on. Even with the mouth breath, you notice maybe your mouth's a little bit drier after. There's an interesting link, I think more research to be done about this, that if we're chronically mouth breathing, one of the components of an exhale is H2O. So when you exhale, if you put your hand up to your mouth, you can feel that moisture or just like you fog up a mirror. So if we're over ventilating, breathing in and out through our mouth, potentially we're even dehydrating our system. So when we bring nasal breathing in as the baseline, we're bringing ourselves into this optimal state. And as this nasal passage is even smaller, we're, we're moving less air less quickly. So we're not falling into this pattern of overventilating which has connotations to lowering the levels of CO2 in our system, which can cause cerebral vasoconstriction. Uh, if you experience headaches or you feel like you get lack of focus, um, cerebral vasoconstriction ultimately is constricting the blood vessels in the forebrain. So we're not getting the optimal oxygen delivery, blood delivery to our brain than, that we need. I mean, about. 20% of the oxygen that we, our bodies metabolize is actually for the brain. It's, it's, everything is around protecting our vital organs in our brain, our nervous system. Mm -hmm. So as we evolved and started, um, eating more food, calorie dense food, fatty foods, and the brain started growing, this forebrain started growing. That's really the evolution of the diaphragm itself and why we as mammals have evolved to breathe in the way we do because we need more oxygen to fuel our brains and the nose uh, evolutionarily coming into play in this way that we're keeping that air clean we're filtering it and allowing it to flow in this way that it creates a little bit of pressure 
So through this smaller orifice, it actually creates pressure and draw on the diaphragm so that we can create this change in volume in the thoracic cavity so that we draw the air in and then allow it to ventilate out through the nose. This is where things can get a little sidetracked because we look at nasal breathing as our baseline breath behavior and where, how we want the air to flow, but it's okay to breathe in and out through your mouth sometimes. There's, there's a time and place for everything. So if you find yourself taking a breath through your mouth, it doesn't mean that you know the day's ruined or that you totally sidetracked yourself. Um, but baseline nasal breathing is really what we're seeing as, as a baseline of our health and wellness, cognitive function. And to build a nasal breathing practice, I think is really powerful in that connecting to breathing as a whole, it's something that happens unconsciously. I think when we go to sleep, we don't have to consciously breathe. Our body does it for us, right? So when we bring in this focus or this deliberate regulation of breath, we can start to build more awareness in our physiology, in our, in our bodies, in our lives, and how we can then be more impeccable with our energy, with how we are growing and evolving. So the invitation there is just to start observing your breath as you move through the day and notice as you start to experience stress or maybe a feeling of overwhelm, check in with your breath. Again, remember a state of breathing is connected to a state of being. Your state of being is connected to your state of breathing. So if you're feeling a, a state of being that's overwhelming or stressful, anxiety, panic, what's happening with the breath? Is it mouth breathing? If that comes through, then maybe you shift the breathing pattern and go, ah, okay, disrupt business as usual, reset the baseline, and then try and practice shifting back to nasal breathing and just continuing to build that beginning again, getting yourself out of that rut, shifting the behavior and the nervous system follows. Yeah, I think it's important that you, you, you said what you said there, because when I spoke to James Nestor, um, I, re I realized, right, I'm sat across from James Nestor. You can see me. If anyone's going to pick up, pick up on me mouth breathing, it's probably going to be James Nestor. So I'm sat there and I'm just thinking, okay, right. So just consciously breathing through the nose. And then he said to me, he's like, you don't have to stress about it. You don't have to make sure every single breath you take is through your nose. Um, you know, we can't all become like a Wim Hof overnight, you know, if you're brand new to this. Um, and like he said, he said, just be aware, just be aware, try and make those 30 conscious breaths a day to begin with and try and build it into that, you know, that subconscious. So I think it's, it's really important that you mentioned that there. Um, and just going back, when you, um, well, 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 we sat there then and took that nasal breath, I almost felt, you know, I, I just felt a little bit more mindful. I felt a little bit more at rest. Um, and it, it, you know, it does have that effect on me when I, when I, you know, I find that link between breath and mindfulness almost. What can you speak on, you know, breath and mindfulness as a relationship? Is that something that, you know, you notice quite prominently when you started this journey? Hmm. Yeah, that's a cool question. Um, there's some interesting literature that continues to emerge looking at nasal breathing and memory and recall. Uh, so another thing for people to explore is when you're, if you're studying, if you're in university or if you're listening to this podcast or soaking up new information or even when you're listening and you're just hanging out with a friend uh, i i was fortunate to spend some time actually with dan brule who's one of the titans of of the breathing world and fun story just to share when we opened up and and sat together before we went into a breathing session he had myself and a few other uh, colleagues of mine going around sharing about our what what we're up to in the breathing world what our goals are and, and who we are and, and as we each were talking, he was just sitting there listening with his ears, but he was also connecting to us with his breath. And he was kind of like sniffing us out almost. And there's this quality of connection that comes from breathing. It's, as I said before, it's a language that goes beyond words. And, you know, maybe that share sounds a little bit quirky, but uh, 
I just challenge people to, to explore that and to experiment with themselves. Again, a fundamental piece around, I think, any practice that we do, whether it's physical training, um, disciplines in sport, uh, breathing practice, stand alone, that we're building more awareness. A baseline of any practice, of any discipline, is that we be that we're able to build more awareness of how we're moving in our physical bodies, of how we're using our thoughts, the power of our mind. So I've spent many years now just disrupting those patterns of whether it be chronic mouth breathing, especially during sleep. You, know, you wake up and if you know your mouth's dry, it's a pretty telltale that you're, you have a pattern of mouth breathing. Again, when we took that mouth breath, maybe you noticed and felt it dries out your mouth. There's some interesting um, research in, in the myo, myo work with the dentists showing how uh, mouth breathing leads to killing the good bacteria in our mouth, which can lead to cavities. Um, fundamentally, if we're chronic mouth breathing, our tongue isn't in the proper posture supporting the roof of our mouth. To consider, the roof of your mouth is the base of your nasal passage. So at rest, if our lips are touching, our teeth are lightly touching, and your tongue is resting just at the roof of your mouth, that light pressure is supporting this architecture, the roof of your mouth, the base of your nasal passage, and allowing that nasal passage to stay broad and opened. And if we're chronic mouth breathing, over time, again, our bodies, our physiology adapts to action that it's almost as if we're a, a wax figure that got too close to a flame and you start to see the skin on our face droop, we start to lose density in our jaw and our bones and the nasal passage starts to close in on itself. Uh, so these are just subtle things I've picked up on over the years of study and practice. I've definitely noticed and felt a more robustness in my jawline, a more ease with nasal breathing. So somebody who even has trouble nasal breathing or a deviated septum. Um, we always like to joke and say, if you don't use it, you lose it. It does, science does point to the fa that fact, but there is a time also for some light intervention, whether that's like a very deviated septum and you do have a procedure to help open that up, that can be very beneficial. But um, I find, as we also explored, breathing's happening right now. So in this whole world of mindfulness, which can sometimes be quite conceptual, like especially getting started with a meditation practice, it's like, okay, what is meditation? Am I doing it? Ah, I'm noticing, I'm thinking, I can't stop thinking. All of these things are happening. I have an itch. Ah, how long has it been? Well, if you're noticing those things, then that's you as the observer. That's you building awareness. And there's a win. That's your meditation. That's you being mindful or maybe mindless because you're just observing all of these happenings and breath is a happening. So if we can just watch our breath, again, something that's happening right now, it takes us out of the future. It takes us out of the past and brings us right into ourselves here. Yeah, this is why I'm so interested in this subject. There's just so many different rabbit holes to go down there's so much to it and there's so much i don't and i will never understand but when i was going through your instagram the other day i was just having a look at, at your content um and i do encourage everyone to check it out it's fantastic you mentioned this vertical versus horizontal breathing something i've never heard of before and it just you know it, it just drew my attention i just wondered if you could speak on that and just talk about it a little bit about what that means. Totally. Yeah, I love sharing on Instagram. So feel free to link up everybody at Whiting Energy. We'll check out the show notes for more information. Always looking to put out fun, consumable content that's educational, playful, and inspiring in unique ways. Again, kind of following this trend that we're exploring. There's no right way to practice, but if we can keep building awareness around how our breathing is happening, then we can start to build more skill in self regulating, in our energy, our state of being. So shout out to my friend, Dr. Belisa Vranich. She's another uh, expert in the breathing world who inspired me around this topic. And 
So I should start by saying that as mammals, humans, we're inspiratory breathers, which means the inhale is what's active and the exhale is passive. Now this is at rest. So all of us, presumably if we're seated listening to this session and as we're here discussing and exploring, we're in a pretty restful state. So the inhale is active. And what that means is that the inhale occurs through the contraction of our diaphragm and the contraction of our external intercostal muscles, which are responsible for pulling the ribs outward and slightly upward, kind of like wings on a bird. And that's what engages the inhale. It's a really a physics equation. We, through the contraction of the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles, we're creating a change in volume. So through this increase in volume of our thoracic cavity, we change pressure and air moves from a place of high pressure. Think of like a spray paint can, you press the button and psh, it comes out. And so when we change from change volume, go to high pressure, we're like creating a vacuum for air to just suck into the lungs. So here we are inflated, diaphragm contracted, external intercostal muscles contracted. At rest, those muscles release contraction. And then we have a change in volume and then air moves out of our nose or mouth. So that's an, how inspiratory breathers, mammals, humans are breathing at rest. Uh, we do engage uh, expiratory pump muscles if we're doing physical activity or moving in certain ways or laughing, for example, or defecating. There's so many ways, again, that breath behavior shows up and musculature is interconnected into that equation. But as we move through our life and we evolve and create patterns of breath, we can start to see how things shift. So fundamentally as an inspiratory breather with with proper breathing mechanics as we could say when the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles contract we're creating this horizontal draw through the inhale so this is what horizontal breathing is the expansion laterally of the rib cage outward and this happens on the front side of, front of our body the sides of our body and the back so ultimately what we're looking for is this 360 degree phenomena of expansion through the inhale. And then same, just contraction or softening on the exhale. And what can happen, especially in more modern times where uh, we're driving our cars, we're seated on the couch, we're on our computers, that gravity starts to take over and breathing starts to shift in this more vertical pattern. And maybe some of this comes up through our susceptibility to media. Uh, you know, I remember even when I was a kid, Lewis, um, there were, you know, seeing the, the covers of magazines with people with like a six pack abs. And I remember walking through the hallway in like fourth grade and I was just bracing and holding my core because I thought that was cool. I was like, oh, a six pack is like what, how I'm supposed to hold and make and move through life and in embracing and holding our core, especially then if we start to mouth breathe, the breath starts to get shallow up in the chest. If we're then letting gravity take over, start to watch people breathing or for everyone tuning in as you even ask somebody, hey, take a deep breath, watch what happens. Oftentimes people will shift and take on this vertical breathing breath behavior where <sighs> the shoulders come into the equation. So vertical breathing is starting to bring in our secondary breathing muscles, like the scalene muscles in our neck. We're starting to use more of our pecs, our traps. And these are muscles that we use in more of our like full burst, like high, high energy breathing behaviors. If we're in a full sprint or we're in a survival experience, um, vertical breathing becomes this pattern where we're bracing in the core, we're not activating the diaphragm in the most robust way, and we've shifted from our baseline optimal proficient breathing pattern. Uh, there can be a hybrid version 
where we're creating a horizontal draw through the rib cage, but maybe there's a little bit of vertical breathing too, where the shoulders are and the muscles in the neck, even the face are coming into the equation. Um, time and place, perhaps, if we're in high intensity physical exertion, because these muscles are going to help create ventilation more robustly, which is what we want when we have a higher metabolic demand for our body. Um, but from a perspective of performance in sport, um, if we can start to strengthen our diaphragm and our primary breathing muscles, then maybe we don't need to use these secondary breathing muscles as much and we can have more energy efficiency. This is, re this is really interesting because it's given me flashbacks to about six months ago. I actually strained my intercostal muscle. Um, in the, I was in the gym, I was training, I think it was a push days of chest. And I just remember I had this quite a bit of a sharp pain and I thought, I didn't think too much of it, but all of a sudden over the next week or two of my breathing, again, it was off. It was really shallow. It almost hurt. It was hurting me to breathe. Went to the doctor. They said, you've probably, uh, sprained into costal muscle and I couldn't take deep breaths without it really hurting. And so I, I found myself struggling and I would always like you said there, which is what made me laugh, is bringing the shoulders. I'd be struggling for breath, and I'd be just to try and get it, and it would never work, really. It would never give me that satisfying feeling. So give me all sorts of flashbacks. Um, yeah. I imagine an intercostal injury is probably someone like yourself's worst nightmare. <laughs> and it can happen. It can happen. Naturally, as we're training or as we're moving through life, things come up, and and then... What's important here is then recognizing that we take on compensation patterns, like I just as you spoke to, finding comfort and breathing in different ways, even different postures, mm. and, and then how that can then form plasticity and our body adapts to that and takes on a new pattern, which potentially isn't going to serve us in the long run. So some of that can then be an unlearning process. Um, I just started actually doing some new exploration with breathing with uh, my friend Prime Hall, who does uh, his company is called Deep End Fitness, and they're doing a lot of pool training. So you're doing breath holds underwater, you're walking with dumbbells on the base of the pool, and different diving exercises. Um, he's an ex Marine Raider, so he brings a lot of experience within water training. And it's been interesting to explore my breathing patterns now bringing it underneath the surface going underwater and and giving myself permission to try easy there and not push it or have an idea from breath practice that i've spent now a decade exploring that i'm even noticing the muscles in my neck getting softer um linking it with dry land training so out of the pool um, a lot of the breathing practice I do. I also actually use this ball a lot. I'm, I'm sitting with it behind me because it's great for support. Uh, it's called the Corgis Ball, uh, designed by my friend Jill Miller. She's another breath expert in the field. And this is all around focusing on improving breathing mechanics from a more fascia perspective. Um, what we're seeing with the fascia, specifically the deep front line, is that everything is connected. So fascia at the sole of the foot even follows its way up through the legs to the psoas, quadratus lumborum, the musculature that connects the pelvis to your lowest 12th floating rib that makes its way up from the psoas into the diaphragm itself. So we could have uh, limitations in our breathing that is actually caused by, by a tightness in our calf, for example, or our psoas. And a lot of the mechanical work that I do on myself and share with others in, in our training programs is using balls like this to help build more fluidity and glide through the fascia in the whole body so that then it ends up impacting all of our breathing musculature. And it's quite fascinating to just experience that again to revisit what we talked about with psychophysiology and, and emotions that get stored in our body that by just starting to use these balls and putting some pressure on ourselves and needing, giving ourselves what we need by kneading out the fascia. Uh, I like to think of it as like the shampoo and conditioner for our mu muscles and tissues, because that's where the issues hide out. And when we, we can free those up and release the tangles, then all of a sudden everything feels so much more easeful. 
and that breath can be powerful but effortless at the same time so it's this balance between like strength and surrender balanced action these are the the episodes i love so much because there's so much practicality in what we're talking about you i mean people can come away they've got so many things they can start implementing into their lives today i love it um so you are a certified Wim Hof instructor um Wim Hof someone I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with listening to this right now someone I've always wanted to get on this show I hope to one day what can you speak on about the Wim Hof method and what direct benefits have you seen in your life since studying it awesome well I love Wim uh, he's been a big part of my journey coming from as I mentioned, ski racing, I, I started in the cold, uh, standing at the top of a starting gate ready for a race in one of those small little race suits, so you're more aerodynamic on super cold days. Um, it's been with me since a young, as I was a young kid, um, getting into yoga, discovering the breath, that being something that really inspired and captivated me to then start exploring and teaching yoga and, and then bringing the cold in. Uh, in 2015, I came across some of Wim's content and it really spoke to me in Wim's charisma, his vulnerability, his courage and conviction in the power of his nature and what's possible in our evolutionary potential. Um, I was going through some personal challenges at the time and just hearing his story inspired me to start turning my shower cold. and. And then the simplicity of his breathing practice and I'll accredit the discipline from sport and also the focus that I was starting to develop from a, a consistent yoga practice that it was so easy to just go, oh, okay, take 30 breaths, exhale, hold your breath at the bottom, wait till you feel an urge to breathe, inhale, hold it for 15 seconds, and then repeat that three or four times. And it was like, awesome. Okay. I, I first time ever I lied down on my bed. And from what I was experiencing in my yoga practice, with my meditation practice, the other activities I was doing, hiking, biking, this just was a slingshot. And it took me into another state of being that I was a little bit surprised by. But it was just like, whoa, there's so much more to explore. And it was timely for me that I came across his work then and there because he had just launched his North America Academy or the Wim Hof Method and the Academy was really starting to develop at that time. So as I continued to practice on my own and getting in the cold shower, starting to do the breathing more, uh, I, I just felt this intuitive call to apply and get involved with, with his work and the team. And I went along the trajectory to, to become a certified instructor and what I really love about Wim, aside from his charisma and, and just this mighty energy that, that beckons from him, is his interest in the science and looking to connect the dots from things that can seem, whether it be spiritual or almost conceptual, to be very grounded in science and to understand the mechanism around the cold and how that impacts the physiology to how the breathing practice can impact from the mechanistic perspective. Uh, and that really opened a whole new world for me. Uh, as, I, as I joked about earlier, struggling to learn growing up, I always was looking for the shortcut and the answer. And when I started training with Wim, I, it was something I was so interested in that I couldn't help but to start digesting and dissecting scientific papers, which sharing that right now i'm I, I i'm surprised that the, I, and i think that's exciting that that's where things took me because now i love learning about neuroscience and that's really where now my world has gone to to start even looking and uncovering the deeper layers of breath and and how then it's not about just one method per se but building a intuitive multidisciplinary toolkit of different breathing practices that can serve you from moment to moment from different activities you do or different tasks and so Wim Hof is very much still part of my 
toolkit. I still teach Wim Hof uh, workshops and bring that into the retreats and all the work I do. Um, and it's been awesome to continue to evolve that as well. Someone else I know you're a big fan of, um, you just mentioned neuroscience there. Uh, I think it was probably, so we're closing in on 250 podcast episodes now. I think it must have been within our first 40, our first 50. We interviewed Andrew Huberman. Um, so long ago, we didn't even record it with video. It was just audio. It was over Skype. It was when we were just starting out. I think at the time, Andrew had maybe had 30, 40,000 followers on Instagram. I'm not even sure he was blue ticked yet. Since then, since that interview, um, it's great to see him. He's just blown up into this. He's a rock star of the neuroscience world now. Um, he's seen so much success, and I'm really happy to see that. What have you taken on? What have you learned? What have you picked up from Andrew Huberman and the conversations that you've had with him? Mm. Yeah, it, it's been fantastic to see Andrew sharing his gifts with the world and, and that mission to launch his podcast and to offer no cost scientific deep dives to the world. Um, he's been an awesome mentor and friend to me. Um, it was really exciting this summer. He came to one of our retreats here in California in Topanga and, and spoke with the group, just uncovering the, all, all of these layers of nature. And, and something I really appreciate from him is his commitment to mechanism and understanding the mechanism of physiology, of biology, and looking to really be specific about how certain protocols can impact our state of being. And uh, I actually found Andrew through WIM. Uh, there was a video that came up one day, and, and this was way back in the day. I think at the time when I found him, he had maybe 400 followers on Instagram. Um, he had launched a new study with a VR type of um, protocol. They were studying the human stress response and exploring non-invasive techniques to mitigate stress responses in humans. So I was fortunate to go to the lab and at Stanford, uh, put on these VR goggles, hang out with sharks underwater, like climb up skyscrapers. And it was really fun and informative to start learning more about the nervous system and, and to understand the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system, how breath is connected to, to both chains within that of the autonomic system. And he's inspired and piqued my curiosity to, to keep asking questions. And this, this summer, somebody asked, how much do we know about the brain? And they said, well, maybe like 1%. So all of these things that we are exploring and that we continue to uncover and ask questions about, it's like, this really is the tip of the iceberg. And with the felt experiences and the practical application and knowledge that all of us are starting to connect to from our practices and from sharing like this, that there's still so much to learn. And um, he's been a gift in also introducing me to other leaders in the field. Um, I found Dr. Jack Feldman through Andrew, who is was actually just featured on his podcast. He's become a close friend and mentor as well. Um, he discovered the brain, the region in the brainstem that's responsible for as the engine driver for breathing. And so it's all, to me, it's all about building relationships and being a, being open to continue learning. And, and that's so inspiring and exciting to me that we have leaders that are so willing to share and that are so committed to continuing to do the work, to test, to ask questions, and even to collaborate uh, with other colleagues and, and putting themselves out for the general public is, is just such an exciting time in the world to make this, uh, again, aligning with my mission, making this work accessible and approachable to the world. Everybody deserves to be able to uncover their own health and wellness journey and to experience what it feels like to be strong, happy, healthy, and to re realize this extraordinary that lives within, within them. It's why these topics are so interesting to talk about on the podcast, because I feel it's a field where the more answers we get, the more questions we have. And it's, you know, it's ever growing, it's ever expanding this research all the time. So, 
yeah, it's. Uh, I feel like I'm forever waiting for Andrew to bring a book out or something so I can reach back out. So, Andrew, if you, I know. So, Andrew, if you're listening, the open invite is there. Um, so it'd be a great book. Oh, I'm so looking forward to. Uh, yeah, I think everyone's always been. I've been having conversations, and everyone's saying, "When's he going to bring a book out? When's he going to bring a book out?" So, I'm sure that'll be a smash hit. One other topic I was fascinated um, to talk to you about is this idea of of nature and our relationship with nature. I think the world we live in now is just almost driving us away from that. Um, you know, you see things coming out all the time and, you know, technology, this idea of the metaverse almost taking us so far away from nature. Could you just speak on maybe your relationship with nature and why it is important to encourage that relationship within every one of us? Well, I love that you brought this up. It immediately brings me to this one quote that I love, which is from Leonardo da Vinci. And it's, nature is the source of all true knowledge. She has her own logic, her own laws. She has no effect without cause, nor invention without necessity. And I mean, I've grown up in Western Mass. It's a, I like to call it the Shire. It reminds me of Lord of the Rings. It's just rich in nature and in forests and, the density from hills and mountains and rivers, just beautiful and simple. And, and I find that nature is such a simple way to humble ourselves and to connecting to something that's bigger than ourselves. Um, as we've evolved and we're all professional thinkers, uh, innovations and technology that's made life easier in some ways. And at the same time, it's made it so much more challenging because we gravitate to these comforts and we start to build these habits of really encompassed into lifestyle. And it's like, what is your lifestyle design and how is it serving you? Is, is that fancy new uh, technological piece that's, um, you know, maybe making your tasks a little bit easier, easier taking you away from these this intelligence that lives within you um, especially when we look at something like the cold that's really something i love so much about getting into cold water swimming out in nature really is my favorite ice baths are great cold showers i like to think of those just like as maintenance protocols when you can't get out into a cold river if it's not winter it's just a way to keep the system sharp it's a way to remember who we are what you're made of and to really recognize that your body is nature. And within that, there is this deep intelligence that knows what to do. It's, it's evolved to this point and it's continuing to evolve and to adapt and to learn. And as we remove ourselves more and more from nature, we start to forget. And so by getting outside barefoot, or waking up in the morning and catching the photons of the rising sun, or seeing the contrast of blue and yellow light as the sun sets, there's these inherent ways that it brings us back to our nature, whether that's circadian rhythm or the energetic field of our body and uh, negative electrons. Like it's one of the reasons I love to sit by a waterfall or swim in the, in the waterfalls, especially in the winter. So you're getting this cold boost, but there's so much energy in that water and these negative ions, or if you go to the ocean and you're breathing that in and whether we want to call it prana or negative ions, there's this exchange that's always happening within our bodies. So I like to always even visualize my body as a waterfall. And so here's this water that's just streaming in. And then we also need to have things flush out. So if the waterfall basin, like our body, it has a dam in it and things aren't fluid and moving, then things start to get stuck and stagnant and we start to build autoimmune diseases or we start to experience chronic inflammation that then just continues to cascade along that way, anxiety, depression, so how can we keep our systems fresh to recognize that no one system in our body works alone, whether that be our nervous system, circulatory system, 
lymphatic system, glymphatic system in the brain, um, and beyond that that's nature. We're connected to outer nature. So if we can stay close to nature, it can always remind us what it is that we're made of and to then have this sense of appreciation of what it is to be alive right now and to really see the beauty in all of that. And, and I think within that humbling uh, ode to nature there is where we can really all start to experience this sense of gratitude for our bodies, our homes, the things we have. Um, I was like thinking about when it comes to living our big dreams and having these wants and needs, I don't think the universe is going to give you those things until you actually appreciate what you have. And when we can really enjoy the small things that we have right now is then what opens up the door for us to receive uh, the gifts of, of what we have in our, in our big dreams. Hearing that took me right back to one of the first interviews I ever did on this podcast. I mean, it's so far back. I wish I could say only my family and friends were listening, but I don't even think they were listening. Um, but I had a guest on the show called Aaron Alexander. Um, he's created the Align Method. And he, mm. he exactly as you were talking about there, he was talking about how he doesn't think people should have like an automated button that lifts their garage door up for them because you're depriving your body of that natural ability to do that itself. And when he sat down across from me on Skype, he did the entire episode outside in, I think he put his laptop on the floor outside and was in a squat and did half of it in a squat and half of it sat on the floor because he said that a chair just took away his body's natural ability to support itself. I'm not sure if you take it that far, but you at least know what he means, right? Absolutely. All, we're so adaptable, and, and I like to keep it simple in those ways. I resonate. I like to explore natural movements. I'm often barefoot. Um, I live in this cozy, small, small home, and I like to keep my doors and windows open. Uh, I spoke to waking up and seeing the rising sun, setting sun. Um, I don't, I, since we're nature, something I'd like to challenge and that I'm curious about is that we have, technology is part of our nature. So how can we be, how can we align with it so that it can serve us in ways that it does and being able to do this podcast and being able to stay connected to loved ones to, to serve others and, and to continue to evolve. Um, certain things that build and bring comfort that we get dopamine from, whether it's our phone or Instagram, video games, whatever it is that may uh, resonate for somebody in their lifestyle. Again, can we be aware of the things that take our attention, that use our energy? How is that impacting us? Is it serving us? Are we getting distracted? And how just what is the impact of our actions and behaviors? And how can we use our technology, our modern lifestyles with a, a intentional attention so that it doesn't own us, but it can serve bringing out the best? Something I touched on earlier is clearly you love to bring practicality this to this subject. Um, it's something I see when I look on your social media media channels, your website. I understand you have a, a live breathing community called Our Breath Collective. Could you just speak a little bit on that, what it is and what that does for you on a personal level to be able to offer something like that? Absolutely. Well, as, as I shared about from growing up as an athlete to then getting into yoga to connecting with Wim to becoming fascinated in the mechanism underlying breathing from a nervous system perspective, exploring and uncovering all the breathing practices, disciplines, techniques, methods. Um, I teamed up with a few of my close friends and colleagues who have worked with Wim, who have studied with Leonard or some of the big breath titans over the years 
and we founded a company called Our Breath Collective. And OBC is a community. It's a platform for people to come together and to explore breathing from this multidisciplinary perspective. Uh, it's a membership based platform that offers live guided breathing sessions. Uh, there's a, a schedule, a range of different times to tune in live. And we also have an on-demand library. So people can log in and practice whenever they'd like, wherever they'd like. You just, you could do it on your phone. You can do it on your computer. Uh, down the line, we'll work on having a more interactive app. Um, we also host workshops from experts in the field. Every month it's a little bit different. And also uh, deeper dive programs like our Breathwork Intensive, which is a four week uh, program exploring the fundamentals of breathing practice. So we look at mechanics, uh, fundamentals of breath, of physiology and chemistry. We do a whole week on the nervous system and its connection to breath, as I talked about breath as a behavior. And then the fourth week, we explore how you can integrate these tools into your own life to customize your own personal breathing practice. Um, Last year, we also launched Breath School, which is our six month teacher training program. So that's currently underway. And we have an awesome group of people from around the world that really the aim to, to facilitate and, and coach, mentor the next wave of impeccable breath instructors that are a part of our community, but also sharing out in the world in their communities. And so OBC is, I like, as I like to say, the place to be for all things breath. Um, there's over 20 different instructors that guide on the platform. Uh, we also host our in-person retreats. We have some coming up. Um, we have a week long retreat coming up in uh, Lake Tahoe in March. Uh, we're back to our signature weekend retreat center in Topanga, California, starting in May through the summer. And then we're taking it international as well with a week long retreat lifestyle experience in Costa Rica. So it's been so rewarding to see how important community is. Sometimes with personal practices, you can feel alone and um, breathing sessions in person with other people is so powerful. And you can really experience that on the same level through, through the live virtual experience. And I see it as uh, the leading platform in the world to build community and to continue evolving breath practices and and coming together with like minds who are interested to learn about their nature, their inner and outer nature, to inspire the extraordinary in their life by starting the day with a short 15 minute guided practice. You know, in the retreat, sometimes we do longer, like hour long breathing sessions. But on OBC, the, we call it the daily breath. So it's a daily breath practice and they're 15 minute practices. You know, so for somebody who's maybe starting breathing practice for the first time, like an hour session can feel overwhelming. And really what we look to do is find the minimum effective dose. You can shift your state in one breath, but with these short 15 minute guided sessions it really serves as a way to build consistency consistency compounds and as you then come together and and start to engage in deliberate regular practice you know everything opens up from there um, so we do have a custom landing page for everybody tuning in here if if you go to ourbreathcollective.com slash freedom pact you can get some more information and, and have a little special offer to check out the platform to come breathe with us come be in community and inspire your own unique, extraordinary. Um, also check out the show notes because there will be some more information there. But it's just so beautiful to see how the community is growing and to see all the awesome, unique people from, we have a lot of professional athletes, NHL hockey players, MLB, baseball players, scientists, moms, dads, uh, scholars, um, podcast host, all different types of people. And really we welcome all levels and, and all backgrounds. And it's just so great to be able to lead the way with, with an open community, an open hearted community and, and unifying with curious minds that really want to tap in and see how they can use breath to serve their unique lifestyle. 
Amazing. So thank you for setting that up. I just want to um, let everyone know again, um, this is not an affiliate thing. So this is something I actually, you know, genuinely believe that people can uh, stand to benefit from. I wouldn't direct them to something if I didn't believe in it. So I encourage everyone to go and check that out. Um, that's ourbreathcollective.com forward slash freedom pact. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. Perfect. So that link will be in the show notes below. Um, so everyone go and check it out. Let's jump in to those final two questions. The first question, um, we've talked a lot about practicality today. If you could issue our audience a challenge, maybe just a little thing they can they can try today, something they can add into their life, maybe it's some, you know, just being conscious, maybe it's just being aware, maybe it's a little exercise. Is there an issue that you could, a challenge you could issue our audience today that they can try out? Mm. Well, as we started, remember, we explored this phenomena, our perspective that there's a state of breathing for a state of being, and it's a two-way street. So your state of being impacts your state of breathing. Mm. Now, over the years with the literature, they've explored that about every five minutes, human sigh. And so this is a very simple breathing protocol that you can bring, add to your toolkit. And whenever you're feeling overwhelmed or stressed, or even after a set in, in the weight room or during a physical activity, you can use this as a way to downregulate your system or to reset. And we'll call it the physiological sigh. Fundamentally, it's just an extra full inhalation. You can make it in two parts. And then you burst the exhale and just let it explode until it hits the bottom. And then you wait for this stimulus to breathe. So we can all do it together. Just make yourself comfortable through your nose. Take a full inhalation. Hold it for a moment and take a little extra sip. Puff up, hold it for three, two, and through your mouth, explode the exhale. <sighs> Soften melt like an ice cube in the sunshine and then just wait not the thought to breathe but this distinct urge from your body to say ah it's okay it's time for the next breath and when you feel that allow yourself to return back to a natural rhythm of breath in and out through your nose and then see if you can make your breath silent so that you can't even hear it your breath so subtle that if someone were watching you, they wouldn't even know that you were breathing. And then allow that to be your baseline breath oscillation from inhale to exhale. And then every five minutes or so to then take that extra full inhale and then just allow yourself to ride those waves of breath. And that's your baseline resting breath behavior. amazing i uh yeah you can feel that right away it's um it's beautiful in a way um i will i think that's really valuable i'm going to clip that up and i'll put it on tiktok i'll put it on instagram i'll reel it just something everyone can go back to follow along um you know if they if they just want to remind themselves of the process we'll clip that up make that available to everyone so thank you so much for that i really appreciate that you're welcome you got to keep it real you got to keep it real for sure <laughs> the final question i have for you today i ask every guest regardless of the topic so for sam whiten right now this could be anything it could be your work it could be research friends family what makes life worth living What makes life worth living is being of service. I've experienced the gifts of giving and how beautiful it is to serve others and to create a container for people to recognize their greatness. And within greatness, I find there's this quality of wholeheartedness that comes because when challenges are at your doorstep, 
it's an opportunity. It becomes a choice. And to greet every day with this open mind and this open heart of what's possible for me today. And, and the humility within being of service that it's not doing something to get something, but there's actually this sort of underlying receiving that happens by giving and that it's this reciprocal current of love and, and how powerful in giving what the community that comes together, whether that's family, a partner, friends, and that you rise by lifting others. And that's my path. That's what I'm committed to is, is serving others and creating this space for greatness, for people to recognize and learn about themselves and to be humble to, to ride those waves of life and to recognize that it's not about the happiness or it's not about the depression or the pains, but this awareness that you can continue to build and streamline through those oscillations of life. And that as you continue to become more aware that you experience the joys and you, you had the highs and you experience the lows more profoundly. So that there's this embedded trust in the process, this trust in yourself and one of the, and in, in giving and, and creating that space, that rapport and the connection that comes from it is this powerful access into know thyself. Mm -hmm. And when you know yourself and you have the experience of doing the work from showing up every day with that commitment, that nobody can take that away from you. And um, I was, I love writing poetry. So you were spot on when you, when you, in the intro saying, well, that sounded kind of poetic. Um, we can all dream big and have these aspirations. I was writing this piece earlier, which I may share at some point, but I said, you must get beyond the dream of your dreams. Wake up and live them. So that's my invitation to dream big and recognize that that's just a dream. And in order for that dream to come to reality, you have to wake up and take the steps every day to live them. So you ultimately bring your dreams into life through the action you take. So get specific, be clear and connected to every little thing that you do and just watch how that ripples out into your life, into your mind, your body, your spirit, your relationships, the connections with others, the beautiful community that you grow and just watch this reciprocity, the way you treat yourself, the way you treat others, it all comes around. That's what currency is, being in the current. So get off the sidelines, the riverbank, jump in and go with the flow. Well, man, this has been an absolute pleasure. Um, you know, it's a good episode when I usually wrap these things up in 45 minutes. So we've gone on half hour and that's, you know, that's the sign of a great episode. It's been one of the best health episodes I've, I've ever done. So I thank you so much. I've enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, you've been fantastic. I hope we get to do this again someday. You have an open invite back on the show, man. You're absolutely incredible. And I really appreciate your time. Lewis, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure to share. Appreciate the work you're doing and in, in helping to get these messages, these words, these tools and practices and, and building community just as you're doing with, with the Freedom Pact and really acknowledge your vulnerability to, to create this space for people to share and Really, there's something so powerful in, in sharing our stories. It's, it's part of our nature. If we look back before we had the screens, we were sitting by the fire. So think of this as our fireside chat. And it's just been awesome that we can have people all over the world sitting around this fire together and um, gratitude for the opportunity to come on. And thanks Thank to everybody you, for listening. Thank you, brother. Let's let them know where they can find you. I believe it's White and Energy on Instagram. Where else can they find you? Social media, websites, let them know. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so you can find me on Instagram, Whiting Energy, W H I T I N G Energy. Uh, Our Breath Collective uh, at Instagram. Uh, we have Instagram, TikTok. SamuelWhiting.com is my website. There's also some links through. Um, I mean, I got a bunch of info on there. Also, Our Breath Collective, as we mentioned. 
uh, please feel free to reach out anytime. I'm, I'm mostly on Instagram, so you can send me a DM, ask me a question. I'm, I'm responsive there and really love to just build community in that sense that we can use our technology in these intentional ways to, to support others and to create connection. Uh, so look forward to hearing from you and, and uh, continuing to put out fun little tidbits for people to enjoy and, and add to their toolkits. Perfect. I'll leave all the links to uh, those in the show notes below. Everything mentioned will be in the show notes, including that uh, albreathcollective.com forward slash Freedom Pack if you want to find out more about that service. So thank you so much. And uh, it's been a pleasure, brother. Yes, sir. Happy New Year. All the best. Thanks for having me on.